So there's this one nutrient that has been researched over 2,000 times, and 30 of those research projects involved human clinical trials, okay? So anytime something has been researched that much, it gets my attention. So I want to talk about it. Sulforaphane. It's not a vitamin. It's not a mineral. It's not a trace mineral. It's not a fatty acid. It's a phytonutrient. So the question is, why are researchers looking at this molecule? I mean, it's a tremendous amount of time and money to invest in this one nutrient. So before I get into what it does, let's first talk about where you can get it from, okay? Well, you can get them from many different plants, but the one that has the most is the broccoli sprout. Now, if we compare a broccoli sprout or even a, a broccoli microgreen, which I'm gonna explain in a minute, into an adult broccoli vegetable, you have a factor of 10 to 100 times more sulforaphane in that baby plant than the adult vegetable. That's significant, not 100% more. I'm talking like 10 to 100 times more of this very specific sulforaphane nutrient. So we have this cycle from a seed to this adult plant. So it goes through a sprout phase, which is between two and five days. And then it goes through the next phase, which is the microgreen, right? Microgreens, you probably see them in the grocery store or at the farmer's market, but it takes 10 to 14 days to make a microgreen. Then you have baby greens, like the baby green lettuce leaf, which is between 15 to 40 days. And then the adult vegetable takes between 40 to 150 days. So if you break down this whole cycle of this plant, the majority of nutrients, especially the phytonutrients, they kind of spike between the seventh and the 14th day. And it's interesting because the average person consumes only like one and a half cups of vegetables and basically almost zero amount of microgreens or sprouts, but they do consume a lot of grains, right? And so what's so different about the grain or the seed, which is the same thing, and the sprout or the microgreen is that the microgreen and the sprout have much less anti-nutrients, okay, than the seed does and as the adult vegetable does. So across the board, these microgreens are not only so super concentrated with not just vitamins and minerals, but phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the things that can actually help you prevent cancer, but they also have the least amount of anti-nutrients that irritates the gut that creates problems for people. But way more people consume the grains and they're getting a lot of anti-nutrients. They're getting a lot of phytic acid, which blocks minerals like zinc, calcium, iron, things like that. And they have no problem eating the grains, but they just don't eat enough microgreens or vegetables in general. Now, if you think about this, just the concentration of nutrients, you don't need nearly the quantities of microgreens or sprouts than you do the adult vegetable to get a good amount of nutrition. So you can actually have less of that. And for many people, that's a good thing because they have a hard time consuming seven to 10 cups of vegetables. So if you're just doing a fraction of these microgreens, you can get a serious amount of these phytonutrients and the benefits of the phytonutrients. Big Pharma is spending a lot of money studying these sprouts and these phytonutrients in sprouts and, and microgreens because they're loaded with all sorts of chemicals that give certain effects. You know, unfortunately, the model of medicine is like you have this one magic bullet for this one symptom, but wouldn't it be better to have a whole complex food that can have a huge wide range of effects to your body? So let's go through these effects that microgreens and sprouts can give you and phytonutrients in general, and specifically the sulforaphane one. The first thing is you get the prevention of chronic disease. Anything chronic involving inflammation can be helped. Sulforaphane induces this compound called NRF2, which gives a potent anti-inflammatory effect. It's not that there's something in the sulforaphane that's giving you something that's similar to that gene. It's turning on something that's already in your body that's then going to get rid of inflammation. It's pretty wild. If there's anything chronic and degenerative, that's where you can apply this. So we're talking about arthritis, Alzheimer's, any chronic inflammatory disorder. Now, the other thing that they really study it for is its effect on cancer. It's very anti-cancer. In fact, Hopkins tried to get the patents, but they got sued and they never got the patents. So they dropped it like a hot potato. But if they're trying to get the patents and spend all the money and they already did the research, then 
it's legitimate. Sulforaphane has the ability to inhibit carcinogens like benzene, for example, is a chemical. Sulforaphane is a very powerful antimicrobial. If you have, for example, some virus or a bacterial infection or H. pylori, sulforaphane can help. Sulforaphane has blood sugar effects, so it's good for diabetes. Sulforaphane targets the inner layer of the blood vessels, okay? It's called the endothelial layer. So it can be very beneficial in preventing heart disease. Sulforaphane has been studied in autism, which usually involves a lot of oxidation and free radical damage. And so we have sulforaphane coming in there as an antioxidant and cleaning all that up. Sulforaphane has effects on aging. It can help slow down this aging process to a certain degree. Sulforaphane is also good for your brain in brain repair, in protecting the brain against oxidation. So if someone has Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, they should be exposed to these phytonutrients on a regular basis. You can do broccoli sprouts or broccoli microgreens. You can also do the radish microgreens or the sprouts or the cabbage microgreens or the sprouts or the kale microgreens or the sprouts. Those are really good ones. Pretty much all the cruciferous sprouts or microgreens have a really good amount of sulforaphane but broccoli sprouts or broccoli microgreens have the most. Now, every so often you hear you have this outbreak of E. coli or salmonella, and that usually has to do with the hydroponic growing of these plants. And the real problem with hydroponic is you don't necessarily have the full microbiome, okay, like you have in the soil. And that is the immune system that protects against these pathogens. So if possible, grow your microgreens, grow your sprouts in actual soil. That would be a lot better. It takes more work. It's messier. But if you can find a farm that can grow them in soil, that would be the ideal situation, especially to suppress the pathogens. Now, on top of the benefits of the phytonutrients, okay, and also getting rid of a lot of these anti-nutrients, there's also nutrition too. So let me just kind of go through that. In a hundred gram amount of microgreens, you have only 4.4 grams of carbs, it's pretty low. You have 2.2 grams of fiber. So the net carbs is really only 2.2 grams, okay? So it's virtually non-existent. Then we have 2.2 grams of protein. Now I wouldn't rely on your protein from getting sprouts, but there's some protein in there. Then we have 11 milligrams of sodium, that's pretty darn low. 298 milligrams of potassium. Okay, that's, that's a good amount especially since our bodies need a lot, like 4,700 milligrams of potassium every day. There's 66 milligrams of magnesium. There's 88 milligrams of calcium. There's 0.7 milligrams of zinc. And there's 66 micrograms of folate. But overall, there's more vitamins and minerals and especially phytonutrients in these sprouts or microgreens. So since we're on this topic, a really good next video for you to watch would be the one on sulforaphane. It's going to give you some additional data that I think is going to be very helpful. And I put that video up right here. Check it out.